Director of the Justice Programs Office here at American University. Welcome to our first fall webinar. This is the first of about six webinars we'll be doing this uh, at the end of 2016, and I hope you will be available to come to some of our future ones as well. The webinars are sponsored by the Bureau of Justice Assistance Adult and Veterans Treatment Court Technical Assistance Project, uh, of which American University has been a grantee for some time. We are excited also to uh, be assuming, beginning this year, the responsibility for the Adult Drug Treatment Court Center, uh, Resource Center, and Evidence-Based Practice Center. So when you fill out your questionnaire at the end of this webinar, if you have ideas about additional topics that we should cover in the future, either through a webinar, through other resources, please do make a note of those on your questionnaire. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Monica Furman, who will introduce our speaker. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Monica, and I'm a research specialist here at the Justice Programs Office. Um, and I just want to briefly introduce Karen Johnson, who is our presenter today, and we're very excited to have her. Karen is the Director of Trauma-Informed Services at the National Council for Behavioral Health. She provides consultation, training, and technical assistance to organizations, systems, and communities to heighten awareness of the impact and prevalence of trauma and to promote the principles and practices of trauma-informed care. Prior to working at the National Council, Karen has over 19 years of clinical and administrative experience in child welfare and community-based mental health. And that's just a short description of some of Karen's experience. Um, but with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Karen, so you can get started. Just a reminder to everyone that we will be holding all questions until um, about when the presentation is done, which would be in about an hour. Um, so I hope you all enjoy, and Karen, go ahead. So thank you so much, Monica. appreciate it very much. However, I do have a question. I am currently perhaps not seeing the slides on my screen, perhaps. Sure, if have... you just um, look at the tabs at the top of your screen. Yeah. Uh, at the top of the WebEx, next to where it says event info and quick start, you should see um, a tab that says trauma webinar. Okay. Um. All Can right, I... so hold on one second, everyone. Thank you for your patience. There we go. Okay, there we go. Trump event info. Trauma webinar. There we are. Thank you so very much for helping no me work through that. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. It is a it is a pleasure um, to be able to join you today. Again, I'm Karen Johnson from the National Council for Behavioral Health, and I want to start um, today just with some reflections. So this slide contains a lot of pictures, and I wanted to let you know, first of all, that please know this presentation contains, does contain pictures of personal and historical trauma, so please take care of yourself in any way that you need to. The pictures on this slide, when I talk about this slide, usually come in one by one, but this platform does not allow for, allow for animation, so um, I would ask you, in this case, to start on the top left slide. I was in a, cab, in a cab in Long Island on the morning of July 15th going to a training. And the cab driver, whose name was Joseph, he turned, looked over his shoulder to me, and he said, well, we had a couple days off. And then there it was on my TV last night. I wondered when the next thing was going to happen, and there it was. So perhaps you can identify what he was talking about. The night before, a man had driven a truck into a crowd and killed 86 people celebrating the Steel Days in Nice, France. And when he talks about we had a couple days off, um, this event that he was referencing was preceded a few days by tragedies in Baton Rouge, Minneapolis, and Dallas. I was struck by how my cab driver, Joseph, started this conversation unsolicited by me. I mean, I, I often talk to taxi drivers in my work, but it's usually about the weather or about the town that we're in. So he started the conversation, and then he referenced the collective we. I was really struck by that, and, and I reflected on, it's, on how difficult the summer has been. Difficult world and national events have dominated our media feeds, including all for Orlando. And, and of course, there are many, many other events and names that go before. San Bernardino, Newtown, 
and you can name the rest. So we are all impacted by the events in our world and communities. Perhaps you or someone you know has been directly in the line of fire and you have provided support. We do know that a percentage of us on this webinar and many people we work next to every day and almost 100% of the people served in treatment courts have been impacted by trauma. So that's what brings us here today. So very briefly, I, um, as Monica noted, I have worked in, in, the, um, in the field on the provider side, child welfare and community-based mental health for approximately 20 years before coming to, that was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and then joined the National Council in April 2014. In my current role, I partner with organizations across the country who are striving to become more trauma-informed. In my previous agency, we had been on a seven-year journey to become trauma-informed at the time of my departure, so I was able to see what it looks like on the ground when an organization is working to advance trauma-informed care principles. I was privileged to um, be connected to Dr. Bruce Perry while there and became certified in his model, um, the neurosequential model of therapeutics. Dr. Bruce Perry really informs our understanding of how um, the developing brain and body is impacted by trauma insult. And finally, I am the parent of an adult child with severe and chronic mental illness. Our, um, our son has been on a seven-year journey, he's 26 now and doing quite well, but he's been on a seven-year journey with mental illness. So after, nine, after 14 years of being on one side of the table, I started to experience services from the other side of the table. It was a profound um, change for me, and I uh, really saw how important it is for individuals in our services and our systems to be, and our organizations to become trauma-informed, the difference that it makes for families and people served in the system. Very briefly about the National Council, we are a membership organization that serves um, over 20, close to 2,800 behavioral health organizations, and through that we touch the lives of over 10 million adults, children, and families. We are located um, right in D.C. and um, provide technical assistance training consultation um, in many different arenas and work and, st and strive to um, impact legislation on the, on the Hill to um, increase the access to high quality services for the people who so need them. So why, why trauma in the courts? So as we're going to discuss, we're going to learn that the prevalence of trauma is high and its impact plays a role in almost everyone involved and in, in treatment courts and is reflected in the various components in our treatment courts. So many courts have come to understand that acknowledging the impact of trauma on court participants can lead to more successful outcomes and more engaging interactions. We know that courts that do not practice trauma-informed decision-making may inadvertently increase the level of trauma that individuals and families experience. So the quotes on this page or on this screen um, come from um, courts in Wisconsin, actually, and um, specifically um, Judge Mary Trigiano out of uh, Milwaukee Children's Court, who is the early adopter of trauma-informed care and in her court system and a champion for this work. And you can see reflected in these quotes that really every, every aspect of our work in treatment courts is impacted by trauma. We have the participant who, um, who this quote reflects that he is, at once, once he is um, connected to understanding of trauma and how that may have impacted him, he's able to reflect on how um, the trauma that he endured over the past 26 years has impacted his um, substance use. We have the psychological evaluation that reflects um, a woman who who um, is truly struggling her way, struggling due to painful, emotionally debilitating circumstances that were part of her life trajectory, part of life events, but not her choice. We have the victim impact statement, which talks about um, you know, the things that happen, but that we hear noises, we jump. And those are classic signs of uh, being impacted by trauma. We have the investigation report, which talks about PTSD and how um, the participant is suffering from that. And then we have a quote related to divorce um, 
that notes that um, everyone involved in that relationship has been impacted by divorce and the ch child's emotional well-being has been impacted as well. So SAMHSA has, um, our Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration has um, created some really nice materials for this work, including the essential components of trauma-informed judici judicial practice, which I am going to actually be referencing throughout this webinar, but I like this quote, which comes from that, from that um, resource. Recognizing the impact of past trauma on treatment court participants does not mean that you must be judged and treatment provider. Rather, trauma awareness is an opportunity to make small adjustments that improve judicial outcomes while minimizing avoidable challenges and conflict during and after hearings. I like what that quote offers us, just freeing people to, up, to understand that um, those of us, those of you in treatment courts that are um, striving to advance this this information, it just doesn't mean you have to become the treatment provider. It doesn't mean you have to be an expert in mental health. It, it means that trauma awareness, again, can um, help to create a court and a system that is, um, is based on the information we know is most helpful to trauma survivors and, and creates the best outcomes. So very briefly, today's webinar is going to talk about an overview of trauma. We're going to talk about the ACEs study, the prevalence and impact of trauma and the ACEs study. We're going to talk about the um, connection between trauma and addiction, becoming a trauma-informed treatment court, and we're going to end the webinar talking about the needs of staff. A very important piece of trauma-informed care is understanding that there are multiple parallel processes involved in this in this framework. So this is about how we interact with the people we serve. So it's about how we interact with the people um, who come, who are, um, who are engaged in the treatment for court process, the participants, but it's also about how we interface with our colleagues, how our employers interface with employees, how we interface with our um, community partners, with everyone. Every interaction um, is, um, relevant in our trauma-informed care work. And so we always make sure that we talk about how this work impacts staff and how we need to be responsive to the needs of staff. So what is trauma? Again, SAMHSA helps us understand, um, understand this through their resources and their work. They pulled together a panel of experts in 2012. This is their definition. Individual trauma results from an event a series of events or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual's overwhelming or life-changing as profound effects on that individual's development. We call this definition the three E's. Um, and some takeaways from here, it's important to note that trauma is defined by the individual. So we as service providers do not dictate how or, or um, dictate how an individual um, experiences their trauma, we listen to how they are describing it, and um, if it's traumatic to them, then um, that is um, how they experience it, and that is how we proceed. It's also really important to note that um, uh, traumatic events don't need to be experienced directly, so witnessing events, an event, a uh, community school or domestic violence, for example, absolutely fits the definition of a traumatic event. So what are different types of trauma? I would ask you to follow up um, from the top, the top left, um, and we'll go to the right and move through the screen. But so in this, in this screen or this slide, we have, um, again, um, reflections of common types of trauma that we see um, in our work as service providers. We have child abuse and neglect, serious accident, accident or illness, trauma that has suffered um, through war. We have natural disasters. And that picture actually, that picture on the screen is from uh, the events that happened in Baton Rouge just this summer. We have significant illness, medical trauma, terrorism and political violence, witnessing domestic, community, and school violence, traumatic grief, separation, and loss, and historical trauma. I so want to talk very briefly about historical trauma. So what is this? So historical trauma, or also called multi-generational trauma, is trauma that is experienced by a specific cultural group or collective community. 
So it's a collective cumulative emotional wounding across generations resulting from a cataclysmic event. It's trauma that is held personally and passed on across generations. So even those who did not personally experience the trauma are affected generations later. What are some common examples of historical trauma that we see every day? Well, this slide here reflects um, the historical trauma experienced by Native populations, specifically the boarding school movement that took um, Native American and Native Alaskan children out of their homes and um, without anyone's consent and put them into boarding schools where um, children were um, not permitted to speak their Native language, where their hair was cut, where they were not allowed to wear their cultural clothes that they were used to where they were not, did not have contact with their families so that they could, in, the, the goal was for people to assimilate. This is an example of um, historical trauma that has, that has um, impacted these populations in a significant way across generations. Other examples, of course, would be slavery, would be the Japanese internment in World War II, um, and the Holocaust. There are many other examples as well. Important to keep this in mind because many of the people that we serve in our, in our treatment courts do have their families and their cultures have been impacted by historical trauma. So trauma impacts us in many different ways. It certainly shapes our beliefs. It shapes our worldview. Um, trauma survivors often talk about the world not being a safe place in which they belong. Um, that they, um, they cannot find their way in the world. It is not a place that is good for them. Um, we talk about spirituality. Now, clearly we know that um, trauma survivors can, um, it can go either way related to spirituality. Often we hear that people say, well, if, um, if this God is so good, this higher power, whatever word we use, that um, people talk about or, or I'm taught about is so good, then I've been missed. I um, am not worthy, and um, somehow I don't belong here. And of course, spirituality can also play out. Spirituality can be a very significant resource for people who have experienced trauma as well. Um, and sometimes people can become very rigid in their spirituality, becoming very, um, very um, concerned about uh, religi religiosity, we call it, where people are um, very black and white about what is right and what is wrong. Those are some of the impacts, that, those are some of the ways trauma can impact our beliefs. We also have identity. Clearly in my work with children, I saw this all the time, where kids who had experienced trauma really believed they were not valuable, that they were bad, they were lazy, um, they were not worthy of, of good relationships or, valuable, or um, high quality services. And when someone's identity is impacted by that, that can um, reflect in um, their, um, how they interface with the world um, in um, the behaviors that they engage in, in the relationships that they develop. So trauma, we talk about it resulting in a vicious loop. And what we mean by this is trauma survivors often talk about um, being in, uh, like being on a, on a hamster wheel or they can't get out of the cycle of trauma. So they experience trauma over and over and over again. And this happens for many reasons. Um, one reason um, is likely that you know, when, when someone has an, 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 a trauma insult, say um, something happens, uh, say there's a, a difficult illness or an accident, or someone is assaulted. So as a result of that, they often, people often um, develop a coping mechanism that helps them survive in the moment. That's, very, very important. However, over time, that same trauma response can bubble up again and again and again as people relive those, those very terrifying moments and um, those coping strategies continue to um, persist even when the trauma is no longer present. We absolutely see that in, in our work in addiction. So that's one thing. And so as a result of that, people, for example, people who suffer addictions are um, placed uh, often in harm's way. They often um, struggle to keep themselves safe and thus they experience trauma over and over again. It's also true, unfortunately, that people who have, are trauma survivors experience trauma as a result of accessing 
different kinds of services. So we know that that can happen in behavioral health services where people are re-traumatized unintentionally, of course, by the people in those, in those systems, but that also can happen in our court system. And so because of, of this information, we, um, in our trauma-informed care, we talk about exercising universal precautions. What does this mean? This means that we need to presume that all the clients we serve, everyone we serve, has a history of traumatic stress, and thus we ensure that all of our interactions, our policies, our procedures are trauma-informed. We use universal precautions with everyone that we engage with in order to um, best meet the needs of the people we're serving. So in our trauma-informed care work, there is a core paradigm shift. When we're doing this work, we change the question from what is wrong with you to what happened to you. And we move from um, what's wrong to what's strong. So we move to a strength-based paradigm and a resilience paradigm, and we understand that the people in front of us have, in fact, survived um, sometimes horrific events in their lives, but certainly traumatic events, and they are here today to seek our help and seek our assistance and partner with us on their journey. And so, again, it isn't about people being weak or lazy or bad. It's a people are impacted by the events that happen in their lives, and it's about, um, it's about their resilience and their strength. This change in question can have a profound impact on how we view people and on, on the people that we serve. So very briefly, the ACEs study is a seminal study that informed our understanding of trauma, of trauma and its, its prevalence and impact. It first was conducted in 1997 by Drs. Vince Valetti and Robert Anda, came out of Kaiser Permanente and the CDC. And um, basically what happened is they asked 17,000 individuals in the Kaiser Permanente, Permanente HMO to um, to fill out a survey and to know whether they had experienced any of these things that are on the slide right now between one and 10. And then they were given a score and their ACE score, it's called, was compared against their health outcomes. Because in the Kaiser Permanente database, they had all those health outcomes. And what they found was there definitely was a dose response relationship between um, difficult things or adverse experiences in childhood and poor health, outcome, health outcomes in adulthood. So the more disease, you know, the more, um, the more uh, adverse experiences, the, more, the higher the chance of some type of disease. So here's one example. We have, um, we have ACE scores as it relates to suicide attempts. Suicide actually, attempting suicide is actually quite rare outside of populations that have experienced trauma. So in the first row here, we have 100 people with zero ACEs in there. In, in their life, and we have one person who would attempt suicide. In the second row, we have 100 people who have three ACEs, in that group we would have 10 people attempt suicide. The third row is 100 people who have seven ACEs, and in that, in that row we have 20 people who have attempted suicide. So it's a 20-fold increase from zero ACEs to seven ACEs as it relates to suicide attempts. The same is very much true with drug abuse. Um, which I think is very, obviously very relevant for, for you on the webinar today. So you can see that the blue, the blue um, column is zero aces, orange is one, light blue is two, yellow, purple, white, et cetera, and the white is five or more. And we will, you can see that um, in the graph on the left, um, if, if with a score of five or more, an A score of five or more, the um, percentage of having a drug problem is much higher than if, if the ACE score is zero. Same with ever addicted to drugs or ever injected drugs. So here is a list of, uh, not, not the, the whole list, but a list of lifelong physical and mental, mental and behavioral health outcomes linked to ACEs. Alcohol, tobacco, and other drug addiction, autoimmune disease, COPD, depression, anxiety, diabetes, multiple divorces, fetal deaths, STDs, um, partner violence, liver disease, cancer, lung cancer, obesity, anger management problems, skeletal fracture, suicide attempts, work problems, and the list goes on and on. So what Dr. Anda says to us is the impact of ACEs can now only be ignored as a matter of conscious choice. With this information comes the responsibility to use it. 
If you aren't familiar with the ACES study, I would encourage you to go online. You'll find, um, you'll find a plethora of information about it. It's been repeated hundreds of times since 1997 with the same results. And this information is incredibly relevant to all of our work, including um, our work in, in treatment courts. So very briefly, I want to talk about, about how, uh, very briefly, um, that trauma insults impact the development of our brain. Um, this is, there's a lot of research around this, and it's a complicated topic. But really, um, the biggest takeaway is that our stress response system, or the stress response system of people who have experienced trauma often becomes overdeveloped. And um, because of the neural pathways and how they're interrupted, um, trauma survivors often, often response to, uh, a default to the survival response mode when, when experiencing any triggers within, within their environment. So it's very difficult for people who, who are impacted this way by trauma to respond, learn, and process. And, and of course, these are the activities and the functions that we expect of so many people in, our, in all of our environments, actually, children and adults. Um, but again, people who have, whose, tra tra whose brains have been impacted by trauma um, do not necessarily um, respond in the same way that our traditional systems expect them to. And that's why we um, strive to create systems that are trauma-informed in order to meet the needs of these individuals. And in, please let me note, the, the goal is not to change the expectations or to lower the bar for anyone. It's to help them um, be able to navigate these systems so that they can be successful, so that they can meet their goals. Very briefly, just want to talk about the, uh, the connection between trauma and addictions. We do know that trauma is a risk factor for addiction, and addiction is a risk factor for trauma. The very simple way to think about that is um, trauma insults, as I noted um, before, um, cause people to find ways to survive and to self to self soothe, and that then can lead to addiction, and then addiction. Um, as we noted, can lead to increased trauma. That's a very simplistic way to put it, but the and it's much more complex than that, but the correlation is, is um, absolutely present. The board, Dr. Gabor Mate um, is a person I would refer you to. He, he is a psychiatrist out of Vancouver, and this definition of addiction I think is helpful. Any behavior that is associated with craving and temporary relief long, and includes long-term negative consequences and that a person is not able to give up. And he talks about early emotional loss, loss as being the template for all addictions. He has a, a wonderful book um, called In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts. And in there you'll learn about his, his, um, his practice working with homeless individuals in Vancouver who really are, are, are at the end of the road. Everyone else has given up on them. And, um, and his process working with them and his understanding of where they are at in, the, in their lives and in their addiction process. So I wanted to very briefly move on to talking about culture, um, understanding that um, we can never dismiss culture. We always have to remember that it's a very complex structure involving um, shared values, traditions, arts, history, folklore, um, ethnicity, nationality, language, religious beliefs, spiritualized, social, economic status, social class, sexuality orientation, sexual orientation, topics, gender, age, disability, or any other cohesive group variable. And thus, everyone we serve, and everyone we serve next to, all of us are impacted by our individual cultures. So yes, we are charged as service providers to um, be culturally competent, to learn as much as we can about groups of people, but we also are charged with understanding people's individual culture. And what we talk about as being culturally responsive is the best way to do that. Um, so cultural humility is a way for us to always be in a learning stance around individuals and their culture who present in front of us. And we learn from the people we serve. Um, we always have a lifelong commitment to self-evaluation and self-critique. So this is, a, again, a very brief um, um, exploration of this topic, but please know that we always consider trauma within the context of culture. So now I want to move on to be talking about becoming a trauma-informed treatment court. So what is 
a trauma-informed organization or treatment court. It is an organization that embraces all the principles of trauma-informed care that um, educates all of their staff around all those principles and infuses those principles in all interactions and all policies, practices, and procedures. Again, to ensure that we are providing services and care that best meet, meets the needs of the people who we serve. This slide um, or just lists the, the basic um, principles of trauma-informed care, those components that have to be present in all of our work in order for us to, um, to be trauma-informed. So we have trust and transparency. We understand that people who have been impacted by trauma are slow to trust, um, and thus it's, uh, it's it's imperative for us to understand that and to always um, understand that we need to earn people's trust, that we need to um, do what we say we're going to do, follow through, be as transparent as we can in our interactions and communications with the people we serve. We talk about collaboration and mutuality. So collaboration would be the, the picture of the boat here. Understand we're all working together to try, to try to go in the same direction. And in this case, the person driving the boat hopefully often, if we can, when we can, is the person receiving receiving the care and the services that we're providing. Mutuality is where, where we um, level the power differentials and try to, to the best of our ability, um, provide, um, provide control, uh, provide power and can give it can power and control back to the people we're serving. Empowerment certainly is helping people find their, their strength, their resilience those inherent gifts that they have so that they can move forward and reclaim their future. Yes, maybe no, this reflects um, choice, voice and choice, uh, making sure people ha are aware of the choices that are available to them and um, are, are able to, uh, to uh, have their voice heard. And then, of course, we have um, gender and cultural and historical differences, and that would be the slide in the middle where we're, where we're understanding that all individuals um, have their own story, their own culture, their own um, gender um, differences, and um, we need to listen to those, to those and understand those components when we are um, working with, with people we serve. So what are some components of a trauma-informed judicial practice? Um, actually, I'm missing a slide here, which, I, which is fine, but I do need to, one, one um, slide, that, one component that has been reflected here is safety. And that's an important slide, so please just picture safety on the screen. Um, safety is really the core principle at, at, in center, that all this work is centered around, making sure that people feel safe. People are not going to heal from their traumas, or I would argue even their addict, addictions, if they do not feel safe. So we are always striving to craft environments, and in this case, treatment courts, that um, embrace safety, that allow for everyone's safety, the people we serve, the participants, and again, all the people um, that we serve next to. So, you know, we talk about physical safety, but we also talk about um, psychological safety, moral safety, um, and social safety. So there's different components of safety, and um, that's a, another area of exploration and, tr and treatment courts that we always want to prioritize. So want to share some components of trauma-informed judicial practice. Again, this comes from SAMHSA's document, Essential Components of Trauma-Informed, oh, Trauma-Informed Judicial Practice. I took, so anyway, that's where this comes from. It's a nice document. The, the link to it is at the end of this, uh, this webinar on the resource slide, and I would, I would point you to that. So what do you say in your court communications? Every interaction in a courtroom between a judge or a bailiff or a lawyer um, with the people that are, that, are, that are being served, the participants, is an opportunity for engagement. For a person who has experienced trauma, they may still be experiencing violence in their lives or they may uh, definitely be experiencing trauma reactions from events that have happened previously. Perhaps they're living in a safe environment now, but they're still having significant trauma responses. For those people, words can be potentially hurtful and, and, um, and not helpful. So, you know, language matters. In our work in any field, uh, human services field, we are always striving to ensure that we are avoiding labels, 
that were avoiding jargon, that words such as non-compliant, manipulative, no-show, or resist, resistant, these words on, this, on the screen are avoided whenever we can. Um, people who have experienced trauma have enough shame all by themselves. Um, so they really, we have to really understand that our language can't be shaming or pejorative in, pejorative in any way. It was interesting today, just today on my, on my email feed, I um, saw a report that came out. It's, it was called, it's the White House Office of Nat National um, Drug Control Policy and it's suggested language um, for government agencies. And um, specifically in this report, they talk about making sure um, we're careful, for example, not to use the words drug habit, this person's drug habit, um, because that um, can infer that the person who is um, struggling with substance abuse, it's a habit that's within their control to change. Um, so that's one example. Now that may seem like a fine nuance, but I think the fact that this report is out there and um, is, is, is uh, indication that there's more and more understanding that our language matters. We have to be, we have to pay attention to this um, whenever we can. So this again comes out of, of, the, of the SAMHSA report and um, this table provides some common examples of comments that might be made in a treatment court and how a, tr how a trauma survivor might hear or perceive that comment and suggested comments that can be made instead. So for a judge or any individual in the court um, to say your drug screen is dirty may not be helpful for the trauma survivor. Again, dirty, clean, I'm dirty, that goes back to worldview um, or identity. I'm a dirty person, I'm not worthy of services, there's something wrong with me. A trauma-informed approach um, would suggest that you could say your drug screen shows the presence of drugs. A comment may be, did you take your pills today? And um, while that may seem very neutral, I can tell you from experiences in my family, um, people who experience mental illness and substance abuse issues and are on psychotropic medication can have very um, difficult reactions to how we talk with them about medication. That was our experience in our family. So the reaction of a trauma survivor may be, I'm a failure, I'm a bad person, no one cares how the drugs make me feel. What's the alternative approach here? Perhaps the statement could be, are the medications your doctor prescribed working well for you? So again, trying to um, solicit the individual's voice, honoring their perspective, honoring them as a person in a very respectful way. So a comment may be, you didn't follow the contract, you're going to jail, we're done with you, there's nothing more we can do. Well, clearly I think we know that this might cause someone to feel hopeless, that they're at the end of the road, there's nothing else that can be done for them, so it doesn't matter how I behave in, in jail, um, we'll, just, we'll just give up. And clearly an alternative comment may be, maybe what we've been doing isn't the best way for us to support you, I'm going to ask you not to give up on recovery, we're not going to give up on you. Very trauma informed. And finally a comment, I'm sending you for a mental health evaluation. Again, this may seem benign, but I think um, the reaction of the trauma survivor here is very right on. It could be that I'm crazy, um, there's something wrong with me that can't be fixed, and people need to do things to me, so they're sending me away. A possible alternative approach would be, I'd like to refer you to a doctor who can help us better understand how to support you. So as it relates to processes and procedures, um, what do you do in a treatment court? So um, we know that a lot of what takes place in a legal proceeding in a treatment court can be confusing to someone in the criminal justice system. Someone is new in the system or maybe someone who's even been engaged for a while in the system. Um, so how do we give control and power back? Um, for example, giving a clear explanation of what is going to happen can help alleviate fears and lessen the possibility um, that the proceedings may be disrupted because someone has become dysregulated. And of course, when someone becomes dysregulated, that means the court proceedings can't go on, but it also means that someone has taken a step backwards and we, uh, trauma-informed care can help us avoid that. Um, 
So again, here's another chart, and this table um, talks about some common courtroom experiences, how a trauma survivor might respond to them, and some alternative approaches. So the first one here, a court officer handcuffs the participant without warning to remand him or her to jail because they have not met the requirements of their agreement with the court. Clearly, lots of anxiety about being restrained, fear about what is going to happen next. Um, what's, an, what's an alternative approach? Um, the judge in this case can tell the court officer and the individual you attend to remand them that we're going to explain what's going on here. We're going to talk about why it's happening. So, you know, example here, the court officer will walk behind you, you will be handcuffed, et cetera, to help prepare people to help um, diminish anxiety, create a little more safety. And individuals who are frightened and agitated are required to wait before um, appearing before the judge. So again, it's out, it's people like feel like things are outside of their control, um, increased agitation, anxiety may result in acting out. So what can we do? Clearly provide scheduling information so participants know what will be expected of them and when it will happen. And finally, a judge conducts a sidebar conversation with attorneys that can lead to suspicion, feelings of betrayal, shame, and fear. So what can we do instead? Tell the participant what is happening and why, and why, for example. We have to discuss some issues related to your case. We just need a minute to do it on the side. This piece here speaks to transparency and trust. How do we engender trust in the people we're serving and be as transparent as possible? That is one example. So other things that we can do in, in, as it relates to court processes and procedures, um, screening and assessing for trauma, in which we're, um, we're focusing on, on asking questions for the purpose of sorting out what a person's trauma history may be, and it can also help us know how we might, ref what, what services we might need to refer an individual to. Um, many courts across the country are starting to do this. We have a court, we worked with a court system in Stark County, Ohio, and they were absolutely screening and assessing all of these they saw, saw in their juvenile system for trauma. So, you know, there's lots of components to this process. These are some of them need to be um, culturally competently done, culturally relevant, never confrontational, coercive, or demanding, always done in a safe and supportive setting. It's also really important to note that we need to train everyone in our system. I think I've referenced it, but everyone in a, involved in a treatment court system needs to, needs to be trained. So this is everyone from the judge and the bailiff and the police and the social worker and the lawyer and the treatment team, anyone, social workers, et cetera, and the people, I would argue, actually, the people who keep the courtrooms clean, the people who do the finances behind the scenes, the people who um, take care of client files, et cetera. Everyone needs to be trauma-informed. Um, and that is a core, um, core component of a trauma-informed organization and certainly is very real, relevant to treatment courts as well. We refer to, um, in, in, in this work in a uh, treatment court the, you would refer the individuals when, um, when, uh, when necessary to trauma-informed evidence-based and emerging best practices. So those are the, those are the clinical services and interventions that um, help people um, recover from their trauma histories and move forward in their recovery and move forward in their, again, in their substance abuse recovery as well. These are just some examples on the left of, of various trauma-informed interventions and the right of principles, uh, our core principles are tra of trauma-informed care are reflected in the evidence-based um, trauma-specific interventions. These are just two examples of trauma-specific practices. On the left, we have EMDR. On the right, we have speaking safety. So then we move into the court environment, and how do you do it? Again, we know that a courtroom setting can be intimidating for individuals who have experienced trauma or violence in their lives, actually for any individuals. And many practices may be perceived as shocking, dehumanizing for someone um, experiencing the courtroom um, environment. So how, how do we make this happen? How do we make these environments safer for everyone? So certainly when we talk about safety within and, and um, crafting trauma-informed care environments, we're talking about things such as signage, such as rules, such as how we handle security now. We know that, um, that um, in a courtroom, 
everyone needs to be safe and security needs to be present. Um, and we know there are lots of rules which are which aren't going away, which shouldn't go away, which are very important. But how do we communicate the rules? How do we structure the rules? Um, and and how are our security individuals um, trained to interface with the people that are being served? And we have one more um, example that comes from um, the same document I've been referencing, that this table that helps us understand some um, interventions that aren't very helpful related to physical environment, the reactions, and then some trauma-informed approaches. So in here, physical environment. The judge sits behind, sits behind a desk or bench, and the participants sit at a table some distance from the bench. So, you know, there we're, we're talking about mutuality. The, the judge is way up high, far away, and is dictating down to someone. While, um, so someone may feel separated, isolated, unworthy, afraid. What we understand is that treatment courts who are trauma-informed are starting to move towards judge, judges coming out from behind the bench and sitting at a table in front of individuals, not always so far away or up high. Uh, other physical environment um, components, multiple signs instruct participants about what they are not allowed to do. And this leads to feelings of, in, of being intimidated, not being respected, not being trusted, being treated like a child. So what do we do? In a trauma-informed um, treatment court, we can eliminate all but the most necessary signs. Words, um, words that remain would indicate respect for those who are reading them. So we really look at our signage and the messages that we're conveying in, in, in our courts. And finally, a court officer jingles handcuffs while standing behind a participant. So clearly, this is something in the environment that can create anxiety, inability to pay attention to the judge, and extreme fear. So what do we do? Perhaps we can eliminate this type of nonverbal intimidation, um, especially, of course, if you have no intention of remanding an individual. But even if you do, I would argue that that, that, like, that um, type of uh, behavior, I guess, would not be necessary. I did want to note that a part of this work is reaching out to communities uh, our partners within the community in order to create communities that are trauma-informed. This is a core piece of the work that is going on everywhere in all states, most states across this country. So we're moving outside of the walls of any given organization and reaching out to our community partners, understanding that the people that we serve, we serve in a very small way, and they are influenced by countless other um, other organizations, other systems, other people. And so the more we can create a, a a trauma-informed community, um, the more impact we will have in this um, in this work. So, this this slide really just is a short list of the um, systems and partners that we engage in this work. And I would argue that the courts, um, the courts, when you bring in your your emergency care providers, when you bring in certainly your legislators, your policy advisors, et cetera. Um, you're um, going to gain greater traction in moving this work forward and having a more significant impact. There are lots of outcomes that are associated with TIC initiatives. These are just some of them. Please know that this work does have positive impact. Um, the, the, the initiative or the framework is relatively um, recent, meaning um, the ACES study just happened less than 20 years ago. So we know that any social innovation does take about 20 years actually to gain, tra gain traction. So we're really kind of right on track with that. Um, but there hasn't been a lot of uh, hard research yet related to um, hard data numbers about specific outcomes related to trauma-informed care approaches, but it is coming. There are, it is happening in pockets across the country. Um, and outcomes associated with TIC initiatives um, are happening. There's much promise in this model, um, and that is why it's, it's taking off in so many places across the country and in so many different systems, including our courts. So what can we do next? Really, the work in becoming trauma-informed as an organization is about sorting out what do we stop doing, start doing, and do more of. Those are the three questions we, we, we explore when we're trying to figure out how to become trauma-informed. So I want to spend the last um, 10 minutes or so talking about the needs of staff. As I noted at the beginning, this work is about 
about the people we serve, but it's about the, just as much about the people we serve next to. And thus, we always make sure that, um, that this work uh, um, is, is, um, has a focus on staff. And, and I think that separates us from other frameworks, other models that we've had, at least in behavioral health over the years, um, because models such as strength-based services or peer, peer recovery services, while um, absolutely critical um, and relevant to trauma-informed care, have not included the staff, the needs of staff. And so this model embraces those previous um, frameworks and then also includes this new piece about focusing on the people who do the work. So Viktor Frankl, that which is to, that which is to give light must endure burning. So we know that people who come to this work don't generally come to it to make a lot of money, that most people are here in this work to make a difference, to have a positive impact um, in this world and in the people that you serve. And we also know that as a result of that, you will be impacted yourself. So empathy, compassion. I have medication for that. That's something to consider. Um, just, but just really the point here is, is there's no real easy fix for um, addressing the needs of staff. We wish there was, but there really isn't. We um, really have to be very intentional about our work um, to address the needs of staff and as, as individuals to address our own wellness and self-care needs. So there are, um, there's four buckets or names that we talk about related to impact of this work on staff. And all of them are very similar. I don't know that you have to spend a lot of time separating one from the other, but I'm going to talk very briefly here. So secondary traumatic stress um, and compassion fatigue are two of them. So it's stress resulting from helping or wanting to help a traumatized or suffering person. Burnout is another um, result of the work that happens, that, the, the impact of doing this work. And that's a syndrome of emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and a reduced sense of personal accomplishment. Now, we know that burnout actually can happen in every field, um, does not just happen in human services. So um, certainly many different types of professionals can get burned out. This burnout curve is helpful, I think, in, in, um, in understanding how, how this concern progresses. So at the top of this chart, we see high work output and satisfaction. Um, that is coupled, however, with excessive expectations. And then when we move down the curve, um, we see that there's hard work, low reward, increased effort, no results, no end in sight, rage towards others, mental, physical exhaustion, descent into cynicism. As we're moving on this curve, um, we're, we're moving towards an increased sense of emptiness and worthlessness. So feelings of despair and hopelessness, loss of belief in any better future, and collapse. The thing that, that is important um, to understand about burnout is that it is a very serious um, syndrome or impact, um, very serious concern. And so when an individual in our workforce is experiencing burnout, um, Unfortunately, I hate to say this, but oftentimes the, the best remedy for that, if they're down at the bottom of this curve, is to actually leave, leave the work, go to a different profession. And that is very unfortunate. That's the biggest reason why we really, as, um, as a workforce, and certainly as supervisors and managers and executives in organizations, really strive to make sure burnout doesn't happen. So I have a, a polling question here, and we're going to try and see if this works. So I think it's come up on the right side of your screen, and I'd just love for you to answer. Is burnout an ethical problem? And you have three choices, yes, no, or not sure. So if you can just take a minute to um, weigh in on this, on um, what you think about this question, I'd welcome your feedback. And I think we're going to keep it open for another five seconds, actually. And then uh, Monica or Anna are going to help me see the results. So I think we're waiting for the results. 
although I'm not seeing them yet, but that maybe means I need to be a little more patient. Is there something I need to know, Monica or Anna? Should, do you have the results to show, or should we just keep moving forward? Oh, there we go. Thank you. Yay. So, um, so 25 said yes, 11 said no, 11 said not sure, and then half, half 50 didn't answer, and that's fine. So m more of you said yes than no and not sure, and I, I do very much appreciate those that weighed in. I, I think the reason I asked this question is I certainly have a bias to the answer. And I would, um, I would answer that um, it is an ethical problem to be burned out in our work. Um, when we are um, burned out, it is very, very difficult for us to um, to interface with the individuals we serve and our colleagues in a trauma-informed way. Um, it's hard for us to be present, um, for us to be positive, for it to be engaged, to be non-judgmental, to be able to be um, focused on using the language that we understand is very important to use, et cetera. Um, so, Yes, I would argue that um, burnout can be an ethical issue, something we really need to prioritize um, as we sort out how to support our workforce and how to ensure that we as individuals are taking care of ourselves. So thank you so much for that um, polling question. And I think, yeah, I can go on, that's great. Victoria, vicarious trauma is another um, workforce concern that comes up, and this is, this is really transformation in the self of a trauma worker or helper um, that results from engaging with, with people who have experienced trauma. And really what happens with vicarious trauma is the classic outcome of vicarious trauma is someone's worldview is impacted. So a classic example would be, say, uh, uh, in this case we'll use the example of a therapist, but it could be someone in a treatment court, um, someone who experiences treatment, uh, the treatment court every day. So in this case a therapist who, whose client um, suffered a, a rape, that therapist may be impacted by starting to believe that her own daughter um, is going to also be raped. And so becomes very fearful of the world, um, believes the world is no longer safe for her or her family. That's an example of how we are impacted um, by the work and how vic vicarious trauma plays a role. So see, there's, these are some of those warning signs, and believe me, there's lots of research online, lots of warning signs connected to all four of these concerns that I've mentioned. These are just a few of them. Some things, if these are happening in your life and in your work, may be warning signs that you need to take a look um, at how you can better take care of yourself. So being afraid to take time away from your daily activities, thinking the worst in every situation, Reacting disproportionately or in a way that really doesn't make sense, that's out of, out of um, sync with what, with the event that just happened. Never taking a vacation, that is a significant concern. Forgetting why you do your job, um, decreased performance at work, constantly not getting enough sleep, not being able to sleep or working too many hours so you can't sleep, um, increased arguments with your family and a decreased social life. Compassion satisfaction is really what we're striving to achieve. So it's the pleasure you derive from being able to do your work well, to help others through your work, to contribute to the work setting or the greater good of society. And I would argue that most everyone who comes into this field really um, went into it to um, experience compassion satisfaction and would welcome the opportunity to um, create that in, in their lives, in their work. So what do we do when we're experiencing the concerns that I noted? Basically, we need to prioritize self-care at the individual, professional, and organizational level. First, I just want to briefly say that safety is paramount in our settings. I, I, I noted it previously, um, but in order to create a resilient workforce in which um, people can explore their fears, their anxieties, have conversations about what's going on, we need to have a sense of safety. We need to prioritize safety throughout the workforce. Um, so it's as important for the people we serve as it is for our staff. So these next slides are really different kinds of self-care that we can engage in that we need to look at and prioritize as we are um, focusing on our wellness. I'm sure you've all seen these types of lists before, and um, I, I know I've seen them throughout my training and, and, and work over the past um, 
two decades. Um, and sometimes, like, quite honestly, it's like, oh, my gosh, now I have to do one more thing. I have to eat health, healthy, too, while I'm trying to do all this work. And I understand that response because I've had it myself. But so, so the point of sharing these slides is not so much that these things are the things that are going to help you um, to mitigate the impact of the work you do, but maybe you have other things. So there's another thing. There's another category on each of these slides. Maybe there are other things that resonate with you, that help you re-energize, that help you refocus. Um, that help you be present every day. So again, you can do this work in a trauma-informed way. These are some examples of physical self-care um, that others have found to be very helpful that I would argue most of us need to pay attention to. I'm not going to go through reading them. You will have these slides, so I'm just going to leave. I'm going to go through these fairly quickly. Um, we move on to emotional self-care um, that, again, is just as critical for wellness, for um, being prepared to do this, this work in the way um, that we ask you to do in a trauma-informed care organization. Spiritual self-care, um, this is often very helpful to many individuals. I would, I would point to the second one um, in the second column, express gratitude. We do know through lots of research that having a, a stance of being grateful for what's in your life, for being able to find um, small blessings and large blessings can help people um, really be very resilient um, and stay in a positive um, place in order to be able to do this work and workplace professional self-care. Please take time to eat your lunch. Connect with your coworkers. Um, find things that are growth promoting for you that contribute to your professional development. Balance your workload as much as you can. Find a workspace that's comfortable and comforting. Make it so if you can. Regular supervision or consultation, incredibly important. Please, um, I'm not sure what your practices may be, but you, we need to prioritize it always. Again, ensuring that we're connecting with others and we're able to express our fears, anxieties, concerns, stresses with our supervisor and find out um, other people's ideas on how to, um, to take care of ourselves, ideas about what might work for us, suggestions, et cetera. Feeling connected in the workplace. Um, we know uh, that this is really um, being connected as human beings. We're hardwired for connection, and, and this is just as important in the workplace as it is in any of the other places that we hang out, such as church or community centers. It has to happen as work and work is at, at the workplace as well. So the need to belong is overlooked in the workplace. We don't often. Um, do enough to facilitate connection, while we often implement programs, systems, and structures that have a tendency to alienate and cause divisiveness. And the impact of failing to create a sense of belonging with our employees not only affects how much they enjoy their work, it has a significant effect on their ability to be productive. Caregiver health, this is a question I ask everyone at the end of my training. Um, we wrap it, always wrap it up with a conversation about when was the last time you experienced joy at work? I think it's a relevant question. Um, it's interesting, when I'm, in, when I'm in a room with a group of people, um, I always get two or three responses right away, and then other people slowly raise their hand. And there's often a group of, large group of people who don't respond. Now, I don't make judgments about that because it's been a long day of training, and they're often tired and are just done and want to go home. But, but um, what, what I do reflect on is there likely are people in the room who don't experience joy at work. And if you're one of those, I would, I would encourage you to rethink that. How can you craft, um, craft your wellness, look at the different components of wellness that I just talked about, and move forward to experiencing joy at work? Because when you experience joy at work, one, that enriches your life, but two, it absolutely impacts your connections and your relationships with your coworkers and impacts the work um, and the quality of the work that you do with the people that you serve. This is a, a, an app that you can find on your phone related to provider resilience. The ProQual is a, a well-utilized um, tool that helps us um, rate where we are related to compassion, satisfaction, burnout, secondary traumatic stress. And there are lots of apps on the phone, lots of ways technology can assist us in our wellness. This is just one example. And then there's, here are some more resources related to, um, to staff wellness, to compassion, um, fatigue, self-compassion, et cetera. And then finally, I wanted to just share these resources um, that are specific to the work in a, in a trauma-informed treatment court. And I think that 
brings us to the end of our slides. Um, we are um, just a little bit past the the, um, the hour mark, but I think we do have time for um, for questions, and I would welcome those. Great, thank you so much, Karen. That was excellent. Um, and we, I do want to remind everyone, first of all, that if you do have a question, feel free to submit it in the Q and A panel, which is on the bottom right side of your screen. Um, and for now, we'll get started with one question uh, from an individual who is asking. In family treatment courts, some of the parents have just had their children removed from their custody, which is a trauma in and of itself. Do you have any tips for court staff or judges about how best to make sure individuals in this situation um, continue to understand what's going on and hear what's going on in the courts? So um, maybe if you could talk a little bit about some grounding exercises or self-care techniques. Thank you. A wonderful question. It, it, you bring up grounding exercises, and, and in fact, um, those are there. there and there's lots of information about it online. Um, don't have didn't have any slides in this slide deck, but you can find them very readily online. And really, those are strategies. Again, just for the purposes that you noted, to help an individual um, come back to the present when they are experiencing intense emotional um, feelings. Intense emotion and other really difficult feelings. Um, so, uh, you know, gr grounding exercise um, really is about helping people be in the present. So you can you can um, talk softly to someone, gently to someone, um, and and perhaps ask them to um, you know, take a deep breath. Teaching deep breathing it's very simple, but that can help someone just find their place. In, in the courtroom, you know, you can ask them to um, reflect on, on how the chair feels, put their feet on the ground, notice any, can you tell me five things that you see in the room? Let's just, just take a breath and sh talk to me and tell me five things that you can see in the room right now. Um, or if that, no, you know, that may not be helpful in the treatment court if someone's already, or in a court system in which someone's already um, triggered by, by um, Oh, by the uh, environment, but then you could ask them to close their eyes and and to um, think about a place where they feel calm. Um, go to that place. You can ask them to um, think about what what are some smells that you um, enjoy that you if you can't smell them now, what do you wish you can smell? So perhaps it takes them back to their kitchen where they where they have you know their aromas that are very comforting. So it's really about um, bringing people back to the present, helping them to take a breath, helping them to um, move out of the survival mode, that mode that is causing them to be very reactive, maybe even aggressive, maybe even um, dissociating, so they may be fainting or just not present, and helping them to move away from that and being able to access other parts of their brain. So it's a really good question. I think, you know, I worked in child welfare for close to 20 years, and um, there's no question that those are just difficult, difficult situations for everyone. And of course, um, parents who have just, just um, been separated from their children, um, clearly that could be one of the most extreme examples or just a, a time when people are really, really reeling from what's going on. And so again, I think um, it's about being respectful, being kind, um, making sure people are aware of anything that's gonna happen, aware of the schedule for the day, what the judge is doing now, what the lawyer is doing now, um, offering opportunities for them to ask questions so that we can we can provide information. And I know there are limitations within a court setting about how much we can engage people in all of their questions, but then saying, so if we can't answer these now, we're gonna go to a room afterwards and we're gonna sit and we're gonna talk about what other questions you have and how we can help. And, and we're gonna talk about the different resources you need. Um, so great question. Again, as it relates to grounding techniques, I would, I would, um, I would go online. Um, you'd find a lot there. Um, seeking safety is, a, is an intervention, a group-based peer-focused intervention, often peer-focused. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be, but it can be led by peers or it can be led by people at any level, master's level, et cetera. But, it, but the Seeking Safety curriculum does have a lot of very nice grounding techniques within that. So that may be, um, that it's just a book and that may be helpful. So thank you for that question. 
Great. We have another question that came in um, regarding language. If a client identifies a urinalysis as dirty, do we reflect that language or try to reframe or change it? I think that's an interesting question because it depends on if you if you have the the um, time and you can have that conversation um, to, to talk with them about how you know the the word dirty may um, may not be helpful for them to change their frame around that um, for them to note that um, you know this may be a better way to talk about it. Um, that you yes you need you need to continue to do, to do to do your work. How can we better support you? But that you know the dirty is not about anybody being dirty or clean because you are a person of great value, and you are a person who is very strong and incredibly resilient. And you're here today to tell us about that. And so um, maybe you want to you know when you're talking to the individual, you can say to them maybe maybe dirty isn't the best word. We're trying here not to stop using that word. We know we've all used it together in the past. But in our treatment court um, that's trying to become trauma-informed, we're trying not to use it. So let's talk about different ways you can talk about it and not use that word. I, I don't know. if um, I guess as opposed to whether you flag it right away, I, 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 we have to be within the context of the conversation. So you just have, and I'm sure you know this, whoever asked this question, but you want to be careful not to, not to um, share that new information in the way that would cause them to think they did one more thing wrong. They, they said a word that doesn't, that, that isn't the right word because that's not the message. It's just, yeah. And I'm guessing the person who asked that question understands that. So that's why I say you want to do it in the context of the conversation when you have a chance to explore how that cannot be a helpful um, word to use. Great. Thank you, Karen. Um, and I just also had a question. Do you have any advice if individuals are encountering people in their treatment course or their organization who maybe are a little bit resistant to trauma-informed care and trauma-informed principles. Do you have any suggestions on um, kind of how to persuade them or continue to implement these changes? Really great question. We we focus on that a lot in our work with organizations across the country because it is very true that people on this journey um, within organizations are all along the continuum of understanding how it can be helpful, understanding how um, why we need to do it, so um, different levels of buy-in. And there are definitely skeptics, there are definitely people who believe this is the flavor of the day and it will pass, and um, this isn't any different than all the other initiatives we've done in the past. So, um, so in our work with organizations, we definitely focus on communicating for buy-in, which is a, an important step in implementing this kind of complex change. It really is a cultural change. Um, it's, it's, mm, it's multi year by the way. It doesn't happen overnight. A marathon, not a sprint. And it's complex. And, um, and there is really very, there's, there's not, well, we don't work with a toolkit to help people just check boxes and then move forward and say they're trauma-informed. It's really about helping individuals embrace the principles of trauma-informed care that I talked about and using those principles to move forward and behave in a different way. And so that, what I just described, isn't about checking a box. It's just not that, that black and white. Um, it's a process. It's not a program. It's a process. So back to your original question, we do often have to um, explore how to bring skeptics along. Um, and we do have to make the case that this is of great value. So some ways to do that is um, to bring the voice of lived experience into the work. That is a, a core component of, of this work, bringing the voice of lived experience. Um, and I, I'm, so I'm grateful for this question and answer session because I get to address that. We always want voice and choice we talked about. We always want to have that voice at the center of the work. And and one of the one of the um, ways that can be helpful is when individuals who have benefited from a trauma informed care approach can talk about it, can talk about how it felt for someone to finally stop asking what's wrong with you, and to start asking what happened to you. Um, there's lots and lots of stories around that. Um, so for individuals to be able to um, tell what it felt like when seclusion or restraint was no longer used and other interventions were um, were used in place and how helpful that was. Um, or to talk or for an individual to talk about how terrifying seclusion and restraint actually is. So that voice of lived experience 
can be very helpful in helping um, communicate this message. And then data. Um, whenever we um, whenever we can um, show um, data that tells us that, in, in fact, uh, our, our workforce has been impacted in a positive way, we have less turnover, we have less staff sick time, or our client outcomes have been impacted in a positive way. Um, more engagement, more successes, um, uh, more people transitioning in a positive way and moving along in their treatment, those types of data can actually make a difference for, for our leaders, for our board of directors, for our communities, um, for our mayors, et cetera. And it is also about bringing those leaders on board, those people who are influential in, our, in, influential in our different systems to walk this talk. So when we have leaders at the front of the work um, telling um, the people that, that are um, in their organizations that this is what we're doing, this is our way of doing business, this is why it matters, please come along with us that is also very impactful. I think training about the ACES study and all the information we know about impact and prevalence, prevalence and impact is incredibly valuable in addressing what you just noted. Um, so oftentimes people, when they, when they sit and, you know, when they attend a training on trauma-informed care, like a trauma 101 type um, foundational training, they do come away and say, aha, that makes huge sense, I get it. Often the question that follows is now what do we do about it? And um, so in our work, we work with a lot of organizations, as I noted, the team network with organizations across the country are striving to figure out what to do about it. Um, so often people get it but don't know what to do about it, and, um, and the work, the trauma-informed care work is really about sorting about what to do, how, sorting out what to do about it, how to advance these principles so that our practices, policies, and procedures are more trauma-informed. But you asked a great question because it is, in fact, true that um, this is, again, we're only tw less than 20 years in. It's still evolving. But, but believe me, the language is changing everywhere. And again, you don't have to go far to find this information talked about in um, very interesting places. Forbes magazine has had articles on trauma-informed care. I mean, that's a business, business magazine. Uh, that is noting that we have to embrace this work. Um, you know, in our healthcare crisis, when we look at the ACEs study, we know that even if we don't, even if we aren't um, what I call the choir, I call the choir people who are really all on board around this work, but if we're not that, if it's, we're an individual who, who isn't in the choir and doesn't, it's very skeptical about why this matters. When you look at the ACEs study and you look at the cost of our healthcare system, it's just absolutely true that we can't afford it anymore. We can't afford um, to not prevent ACEs and then mitigate the, out, the impact of ACEs when they happen. We just, we are just, our healthcare costs won't allow it. So those are some of my ideas related to your question. That's excellent. Thank you, Karen. I mean, it looks Thank like you. we have one more question, unless any others come in. Um, this relates to veterans treatment courts. And the individual says, in veterans courts, we're typically working with a population that is often suffering from PTSD, traumatic brain injuries, and military sexual trauma. In the event that they're conducting a home visit with their resource or probation officer, do you have any tips on how they can make sure that they are monitoring effectively but also not re-traumatizing the individual? So, um, again, a great question. And again, I, I think it, my first first line of thinking is to go back to the principles. So how do we how do we give power and control back to the individuals? How do we ensure that people are feeling safe with the interaction that's going to take place? How do we ensure that we are um, honoring that person's voice and choice? Of course, respecting their home. Um, so um, I think. It's about how, how you know how we present ourselves in 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 the in the home. It's about um, always asking permission. Um, can I sit here? Is this where you'd like me to sit? And then, et cetera. That's one example. Always asking permission for anything you're going to do. But then, um, um, again, um, laying out or outlining what's going to take place in the half hour, hour visit, or whatever it is. This is why we're here. This is why we need to be here. Um, this is what we're going to do. Um, how does that work for you? Um, please tell me how we can make this easier. Um, 
how can we best meet your needs? You know, I, I'm not sure all the components that would be at play here, but I'm guessing that it's individual. You know, maybe there's, uh, it has to happen, it's mandated, so it's not a volunteer thing, so it's that the individual can't ask you to leave necessarily, but to acknowledge that and say, I know this is difficult, thank you so much for having me. I'm, um, uh, I, I know you perhaps wish this wasn't going to happen. Don't want to make assumptions, however, but if you believe that's the case, you could likely say that. And so how can we partner together to make this half hour hour most um, effective for you, most doable for you? And I mean, all, you know, I'm just, I'm just thinking as how I would, how I used to approach home visits when I was in child welfare, was in the home a lot. Always making sure um, you're engaging the individual and care about them as a human being can make a huge difference. So honoring what's on the walls, if it's a place um, that you can do that, you know, asking questions about the people that are reflected in the pictures in, in, in the home, um, engaging the individual um, about what their needs are, um, et cetera. So those, those are some of my ideas. Um, always, of course, another thing that always comes to mind is making sure you are, in fact, safe as the home visitor um, that, you know, there's lots of training around that as well, ensuring everyone's safety in a home visit. So, uh, well, one, one, inter one piece to consider is how, how would you exit? You know, you don't ever want to be in a situation where you can't exit. If it's a place where your gut is telling you you should be, can't necessarily be there, how do you get more support and come back? All of those things. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, maybe rambling or brainstorming a little bit, but I think, I think when we go back to the core principles of of trustworthiness, transparency, collaboration, mutuality, um, paying attention to cultural differences, um, empowerment, and um, and then safety. Always about everyone's safety, and and just again paying attention to language. And if it doesn't go well, um, not judging anyone, making sure you understand this is no one's fault. It didn't go well today, but we're going to try again tomorrow. And of course, if someone becomes this up dysregulated or escalated, then ensuring you have the backup you need to, to make sure everyone stays safe. Great. Thank you, Karen. And it looks like that's all we have for questions. So I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up here. Um, and I want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. And as Tracy mentioned at the beginning, we have um, about five more webinars coming in the next month or month or two. So, so stay stay tuned for that, and we will be sending out a link to the recording of today's webinar, which we'll be posting on our YouTube page, as well as the PowerPoint slides and um, a couple of supplemental documents as well. So, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Karen or our office at justice@american.edu. And thank you all for your participation today, and thank you, Karen. Thanks. Monica, can I, and can I just say one more yeah. thing? Thank you all. Um, thank you, everyone, for the work that you do. Um, you make a difference in the lives of the people you serve, and thank you so much for those contributions that you make every day. And thank you for having me. And Great. Thank, thank you, Karen. Thank you.